I'm a feminist, but here at the BFI, British Film Institute, for our international listeners, I just saw posters for the documentary Bombshell, the Hedy Lamarr story, and thought she looked so haunted by her own beauty in the poster that I want to be Hedy Lamarr, even though she's dead. <laughs> I want to be haunted by my own beauty, though. Well, I, I would. I'd no, I wouldn't, to... actually. Oh, there's a little part of me. Not all the time. Like half an hour a week haunted wanna... by my own beauty. No, I... I've got stuff to... I'm a busy woman. I can't be haunted by my own beauty. I can wake up. Oh, I'm haunted. No. But you got just... it wrong. You want to haunt other people with your beauty. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. That's the sort of... But so beautiful. That you just wake up and you're like... Oh! Yeah, just... You know the power of your own beauty and you know that you're just having this big, permanently powerful effect on the world. Are you haunted by my beauty? A little bit. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but when I had the choice of wearing my I'm a feminist t-shirt because feminism is in, I decided, fuck that, I'm going to wear a Ryan Gosling t-shirt. Yay! I'm very suspicious of I'm a feminist t-shirts, mainly because they just don't make you look good. What does that mean? <laughs> well, listen, if you're going to wear a T-shirt and you're broad like me, you just want it to be, like, nicely fitting. And every time I wear, like, a size T-shirt that fits me that says I'm a feminist, I'm like, hang on a minute, why do I not look like a sexy, hot feminist? Because, let's be honest, we have to be good-looking. I think you've misunderstood the tone of the show, Susie. Have I? <laughs> have I? I'm joking. Go. Okay. I'm a feminist but I wondered if I should take more video of myself so that when I die, there can be a documentary about me called Bombshell, the Deborah Francis White story. <laughs> just should be daily, just sort of, you know, a little bit of... But it just all of the work I have to go through to get the lighting right and get my makeup done, yeah. I can't be asked Because I don't want rubbish video of me, just That's like true. Go cleaning my teeth and stuff. I'm a feminist, but when Emma Stone during the Oscars of this year, said, um, and here are the four director nominees and Greta Gerwig, I nearly straight up was like, I'm going to fight you. Do not ignore Jordan Peele. I'm sorry. He is a black man and he is not part of the status quo. And I was like, I'm on board with this. And then she said that and I was a bit like, mm, no. Um, if Emma Stone wants to work with me, that's fine. Um, uh, call my agent. Sorry, that Shit. wasn't where that was meant to be going. No, no, because what You're I've done... You're meant to take it a stand. Yeah. And then, so listen, and then I, I doubled back. I thought you were about to do a Rosa Parks, a Hollywood yeah, Rosa Parks. Yeah, I was. But... And then you were like, have my seat as long as I can be in your movie. <laughs> Guilty feminist. I'm a, fe <laughs> I'm a feminist. But I'm kind of sorry the word bombshell, which applies exclusively to a woman whose main purpose is the sexual arousal of her audience, has gone out of fashion. Bombshell. The word just sounds like you're so sexy it's violent. <laughs> like sometimes I just like a bit of that old school. Okay, I'm a feminist, but actually on that, one of these antique words like bombshell, last time I was in New York, I was walking uh, in Brooklyn and this guy said, mmm, you're a nice bit of cheesecake. And I was like, oh, okay, now, then my brain went, Brrr. I was like, okay, so I read this biography about Marilyn Monroe and I swear that she was like 1952 cheesecake of the year in some sort of objectifying magazine. So cheesecake is a term that is like, oh, hot pinup, but also cheesecake is my favourite cake. And so I just accepted what he said. Did you do a cheesecake. Homer Simpson? Mm, where you, were, you started out being offended <laughs> yeah. by being sexually... Went, oh, and then you just went, oh, cheesecake. Yeah, that's... <laughs> Do you know what? That's what it was. Like, I, I was, he just said cheesecake. I was like, I'm hungry. Yeah. <laughs> Live from the BFI in London, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Susie Bacoma, and very special guest, Cara Theobald, talking about female friendships on screen. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. So today we're talking about uh, female friendships on screen and why they're important, why it's important for feminism to see female friendships portrayed on screen and to be represented on screen and to be role modelled on screen and sometimes what we take from them, what we learn from them, how they shape our own friendships. Because I think 
romantic relationships have been massively shaped by cinema. Massively. I honestly think if it wasn't for cinema, we would have hardly any of the expectations that we do about kisses, absolutely, monogamy, absolutely. walks home in the rain. Yeah. Um, <laughs> relationships that are so wrong that they should be right yeah they're not they're just wrong (laughs) they're just wrong but on screen when a relationship is wrong a romantic relationship it's really secret code for he's the only one you should be with or she's the right one for you or they're the person of your dreams yeah i think it's like with most romantic relationships it's oh was your first impression about this person that you hate them (laughs) then they will be your life partner You right? Don't, you don't. That doesn't really work out with, right? with friendships. It's like, oh, you really detest this person. If then they, you're going to fight until the very end. It's true. If the first thing that happens is someone throws orange juice in your face, then no, move on. <laughs> but cinema, the story, of course, needs needs grit and it needs tension it and does. it needs, you know. And there is something about it is true actually what? that if someone sort of rubs you up the wrong way a bit, that can be oh, kind of sexy. Yeah. It does work. It does work, but usually for just short flings. Oh, yeah, for a, after a while, like sort of the week yeah. three. Then I'm like, can you just like me in a straight, like really straight and narrow kind of direct way or just leave me alone? Yes, exactly. Can you just and then the moment they leave you alone, then you're like, well, whatever, where are you going? Exactly. <laughs> but female friendships, well, some of them are portrayed similarly on screen and we will get to that. But I think some of my favourite relationships on screen are not romantic relationships and they're certainly not relationships about people punching and shooting. That's my husband's favourite genre, punching and shooting. <laughs> I will often say, like, what are you watching? Like, you know when someone's late at night, sort of, oh, well, watch a bit of Netflix or something. And I'll go, are you watching Punch Face? And he'll go, yeah. Punches. Yeah, I'll of course call whatever show he's watching Punch Face. See, it's code and sometimes he goes, no, this is zombie Punch Face. <laughs> See, my mum, my mum liked the genre of punch face. Does she? Like, she really did. Like, I grew up being coerced into watching Arnold Schwarzenegger films. That's what I grew up watching. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so my American accent was really weird. Because I took it, because I thought he's the ultimate American action hero. So I was like, get down! Get down! In, like, my playground in South East London. And everyone was like, what's that? I was like... Uh, the greatest action hero of America of all time. And they're like, he's not. He's Austrian. I was like, what? Um, <laughs> so you like, thought an American accent was an Austrian accent? Yeah, for too Aww. long. <laughs> that's so... I love you so much, Susie. Oh, that's and I'm, right. I'm charmed by your five-year-old self. Please tell me you were five. I was about uh, five. five. Not Watching 15. violent films like Commando. <laughs> wow. Which is just... And I was there going, what's happening? Good doll. <laughs> Please put your hands together for Deborah Francis Why? These are things I have learnt about female friendship from movies I love. And it's also a quiz. You are going to guess the movie. When you think you've got it, Could you shout, I've got it, but not shout the name of the movie? When all the clues are done, I'm going to get you to shout it as one. All right, these are things that I have learned about female friendship from movies I love. A true friend will tell you when a lipstick makes you look like a corpse. Not one person has got it, that's it. None of you are as big fans of this movie as I am. I'm very already feeling happy with myself. You can't really fall out with your true best friend, but sometimes you need to take breaks. Do you work for the BFI, though? It's cheating. You know all about movies. When you admire a woman so much, you want her to be your best friend. Sometimes you're a little jealous of those exact same qualities. Sometimes one of you will be so jealous you can hardly breathe. Got it. Got a few got it's there. (laughs) <laughs> including Susie Bacoma. If your best friend has really beautiful hair, she will still spend an hour and a half dyeing it exactly the same colour in solidarity with you going blonde. And finally, romantic relationships don't always last the distance, so you might need your best friend on your deathbed. Got it, got it, got it. All right, if you think you've got it, just shout, got it? Got it. Got it. 
Have you no idea, Shut. no idea? No idea. Wow. Okay. All right, I'm going to give you one more clue. It must have been cold there in my shadow. Oh, uh, got it. What is it? One, two, three? Delicious. Correct. What was that one? What did you think it was? Someone said something else. What did you say? Death becomes her. <laughs> Must have been cold there in my shadow. Okay, this is quiz number two. Things I've learnt from this movie about female friendships. The cool girls in school aren't always the cool girls in life. Now, you think you've got it. You've got, you haven't necessarily. Some of you are thinking the wrong movie. If you embezzle cash, your true best friend will help you spend it. A true friend will tell the mean girls, stick your drink up your ass, Tanya. I'd rather swallow razor blades than drink with you. Got it. Oh, and by the way, I'm not alone. I'm with her. <laughs> your best friend will leave town with nothing but you, your wheelchair and a suitcase and start over again because, and I quote, since I've met you and moved to Sydney, I haven't listened to one ABBA song. And that's because my life's as good as an ABBA song. It's as good as Dancing Queen. Got it. What is that? Wedding. Okay, this is the next one. A true friend will protect you when the law won't. A true friend will understand if you need to abandon her briefly to have sex with Brad Pitt. <laughs> we all have to die at some point and there are worse ways to go than holding hands with your best friend with one finger up to the authorities while you go over a canyon. What is it? Elmer Louise. Elmer Louise, of course it is. If another woman gets accidentally pregnant, this can be an opportunity to become close friends with her. Can be. You and I, sister. If abortion isn't legal where you are, a true friend will learn the merengue so you can live the feminist value of your body, your choice. Sometimes your sister doesn't seem like your best friend, but underneath she always is. She will cover for you to your parents and she knows your hair looks prettier your way. This is the final clue. Join hands and hearts and voices, voices, hearts and hands. At Kellerman's, the friendships last long as the mountain stands. One more verse. Join hands and hearts and voices, voices, hearts and hands. At Kellerman's, the friendships last long as the mountain stands. What's the movie? Dirty Dancing. Dirty Dancing, of course it is. Thank you very much. So for our challenge, we asked our producer, Tom Selinski, to prepare a scene from a famous film about female friendship. And we don't know what it is. We're going to sight read it, but we're going to read it with all the passion as if it were beaches. Might be beaches. Who knows? Let's hope it's beaches. Um, okay. Set in a coffee shop. Right. Set in a coffee shop. You can be Hannah and you can be Nell. Okay. Oh, okay. Right. I'm going to be Hannah and you're going to be Nell. Okay. okay. Seven years in San Quentin. In the hole for three. McNeil before that. Are you looking to go back? I worked some crews. The guys were looking to fuck up and get busted back. <laughs> <laughs> you must have worked on some dipshit crews. I worked all kinds. <laughs> you see me doing thrill-seeker liquor store hold-ups with a born-to-lose tattoo on my chest. No, I did not. <laughs> you never wanted a regular type life? What the fuck is that? Barbecues and ball games? Yeah. A guy told me one time, don't get attached to anything you're not willing to walk out on in 30 seconds flat if you feel the heat around the corner. Now, if you're on me and you've got to move when I move, how do you expect to keep a family? That's pretty vacant. It is what it is. It's that or we both better go do something else, pal. I don't know how to do anything else. Neither do I. I don't much want to. Neither do I. You know, we're still sitting here, you and I, like a regular couple of fellas. <laughs> you do what you do. I do what I got to do. If I'm there and I, I've got to put you away, I won't like it. <laughs> but I'll tell you, if it's between you and some poor bastard whose wife you're going to turn into a widow, 
Brother, you're going down. There's a flip side to that coin. What if you do get me boxed in and I've got to put you down? Because no matter what, you will not get in my way. (laughs) Maybe that's the way it will be, or who knows? (laughs) Or maybe we'll never see each other again. Join hands and hearts and voices, voices, hearts and hands. Tom, is I that from the clue. famous film about female friendship, Heat? <laughs> With Al Pacino and Robert De Niro? Yeah. Uh, as as you get. To female friendship on screen. <laughs> Well, do you know what? It was enjoyable to play out a sort of... I felt stronger. Yeah. Immediately. A a sort of male frenemy. Women don't get dialogue like that normally, do we? We don't get dialogue like that. Barbecues and ball games? I've never said that. I mean... This is gold. Yeah. You must have worked... You must have worked some dipshit crews. Dipshit. Dipshit. You see me doing thrill-seeker liquor store hold-ups with a born-to-lose tattoo on my chest? (laughs) <laughs> no, I do not. You never wanted a regular type life. This is, it is good stuff. Could we do a little bit of it again, but could you do it as Arnold Schwarzenegger? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to do it like a real bloke now. Okay, right. Okay, go. Let's do the opposite line, so you okay. stop. Oh, gosh. Okay. What's up? Yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger. No, now it's not like Sean Connery. Um, seven years in San Quentin. <laughs> In the hole for three. <laughs> McNeil before that. There we go. I'm into it. You're looking to go back. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry, Austrians, but he does have a really bad American accent. I worked some crews. Those guys were looking to fuck up and get busted back. You must have worked some dipshit crews. I worked all kinds. You. S- you see me doing thrill seeker hold ups with a born to lose tattoo on my chest? Do you see that? No, I don't. You never wanted a regular type life. What the fuck is that? Barbecues and ball games? Yeah. A guy told me one time don't get attached to anything you're not willing to walk out on in 30 seconds flat if you feel the heat around the corner. That's heat, the name of the movie, right there. You just saw it, just slipped it in like that, like nothing. Now, if you're on me and you gotta move, when I move, how do you expect me to keep a family? That's pretty vacant. <laughs> I think I've, I've, I think that's an improvement. I think that's an improvement. <laughs> I think it's time for a remake, Hollywood. It went down really well when they remade <laughs> Ghostbusters with women. So I can only assume when we reboot Heat, just you and me, yeah, you, me. you as Arnold Schwarzenegger, me as Arnold Schwarzenegger, that it's going to, I mean, no guy is going to say that's going to ruin his childhood. I think oh, it's going to work out really well. They won't well. be crying on YouTube. They'll be really, really excited. Happy about it. Yeah. Please welcome to the stage the wonderful Susan McCarma! <laughs> Cool. So I was quite a peculiar kid. Now, I know that sometimes people <laughs> people lie about this. They go, oh my gosh, I was such a loner. I was such a loner. And now I'm just like not a loner. And I just know myself. They're lying. People who say that, they were popular at school or bullies. Like, I just don't believe that. they was That sort of Cinderella story of like, oh no, I was really weird. And now I'm just like not. But I completely was. I was really, really odd. So much so that I do remember catching my parents looking at me a couple of times like... (laughs) I don't know, you know. I don't know. (laughs) This one will either become, I don't know, a scientist or a murderer. She will kill someone. I don't know. (laughs) Sounds probably weird. Now, what I didn't really, I didn't really like watching friendships on television because I'd get jealous. What I wanted was to feel an affinity with the person on TV. So... For instance, it took a little while before Moesha landed on terrestrial TV. But when she arrived, I was like, oh, my God, she's got braids. She looks like me. But before that, it was mainly just sort of old murder she wrote. That was I, that was <laughs> pretty. I was like, oh, my gosh, if we could just meet and then solve crimes. But she lives so far away. How do I? I don't think I've got her. Oh, Mum, have I got my passport? Is it up to date? Anyway, um, so 
I felt a lot of kinship with a lot of um, people on television. And I feel like one of the things I struggled with was that a lot of people that I'd watch on television, you know, like Murder, She Wrote, were not like me. And so it means that I have had to travel outside of myself. I've had to, you know, empathise with stories and narratives that aren't close to me. I've had to look further, you know, beyond the end of my own nose. Basically, what I'm saying is that I'm an exceptional human being because <laughs> I empathise tremendously. That's what I'm saying. I know the audience of this show. And um, I think that the woman who completely changed my life actually was Helen Mirren in Prime Suspect. A very strange thing for a young black girl to be watching. But again, I just thought, okay, right. She's also solving crimes. I'm looking at the scenes on TV. These look like a bus ride away. I don't need to get a passport. We can do this. I can find her. I can find Tennyson and then we can just like solve stuff. Now, I live, my family, I grew up in Elephant Castle. And what is very cool about Elephant Castle, not anymore because it's all gentrified now, is that we had loads of film sets and TV sets all around us. And so sometimes I would meet these people. And I did kind of meet Helen. I kind of met, I didn't, I stalked Helen Mirren. <laughs> <laughs> True story. I stalked Helen Mirren. She was in, I think it was the Tesco's in there, was it the Tesco? Anyway, there was a shopping centre. I was there with my mum. I saw Helen Mirren and I just followed her around. The whole time I was following her around, I was thinking, okay, I think I'm the criminal here. We're meant to be solving crimes together, so I've got that wrong. So that didn't work out right. What I then discovered is right by us was the LWT Studios. And so my little sister went through a phase where she'd always go to LWT Studios to find like Blue. You know the boy band Blue? She'd always be there. And I was just like, I just want to find people off the telly who I thought were my friends, but ultimately don't know who I am. And then I met Helen Mirren for a second time. And this time I just stared at her. I just stared at her as she walked in and I thought, if I just keep still, she won't know that I am the stalker from the other time in Elephant and Castle. And so that happened. And I thought, you know what? I've got to get better at this. I've got to actually form my own friendships. And since being an actress, that's one of the things that I've really, really wanted. Well, those of my actress friends, we always like to talk together and we always go, it's really annoying because there's always one of us in a room whenever they're together. And I've had one of the greatest joys, this is a bit soppy, I've had one of the greatest joys in the last few years to finally have my own on-screen fighting dynamic friendship. And I'm going to give it away, but she is our guest today. And to finally be part of a duo of women who are just out there fighting crime slash supernatural things um i felt like i finally found my helen mirren she's gonna kill me for calling her helen mirren <laughs> she loves it but thank you very much um we've got a surprise for you helen mirren, mirren, mirren is here this afternoon no she's not she's not but it's a bfi she could be she's not out there somewhere doing a q a is she could we get her in here Oh, my gosh. She, she must have oh been no. here before, like, doing Q&A. She has been, hasn't she? Yeah, yeah, loads, loads. If we'd known... If you let me know the exact time <laughs> and which auditorium... You might work with her now. You're very successful well, now. Well, I have to work with her now since I've ruined things with Emma Stone. <laughs> <laughs> Our guest today is an actor who you will know from Downton Abbey, The Syndicate, and, of course, <laughs> from her famous on-screen friendship with the wonderful Susie Wacoma doing Crazy Head. Please put your hands together for Cara Theobald! Hello. Can I just I, say, an example of female friendship is when your friend compares you to Helen Mirren in front of a group of people I mean that's just I saw you tear up over there Aww. I really did you did yeah thank you she's great shining moment I'll be honest with you seeing you two next to each other makes me want to go <gasps> who's behind me I feel like a bad supernatural being is standing behind me and is about to grab me by the throat you two unnerve me if they did we would have your back we'd so know what well, you'd get out your this. flickers yeah, and you'd like flickers, big, batten, big batten, 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 batten short you batten, batten, batten to beat them up you get uh, out of the do you guys all know crazy head <laughs> It's an incredible show, and if you haven't seen it, you absolutely should. 
Do you want to give a quick summation of it for anyone who hasn't seen it? Crazy Head is about two girls. One is a seer and one is... Oh, spoiler, but half demon. Basically, two girls together (laughs) saving the world from demons in a very, very British, very filthy way. Yeah, it's very, very funny. But the comedy never undermines the stakes. I think that the themes about female friendship are incredibly real world. It's about like what happens when your friend changes or becomes an addict. It's about what happens when you think your friend's boyfriend is hurting her and you want to step in, or about what happens when you've accidentally killed your friend by performing (laughs) an exorcism on her and it's gone wrong and then she comes back from the dead and wants to live with you. Um, (laughs) Do you agree? Absolutely, especially the last one. Yeah. I mean, I really personally can relate to that. It was very helpful for my role. Did you know each other when you first started working together? No, we knew of each other. We have lots of mutual friends. I think I found you your house. Oh my Remember? gosh, you did. Yeah. yeah. Is this yeah. like when you were stalking Helen Mirren, though? Were you <laughs> so just standing at the front of it because you'd seen her in Cara? Had you just um, seen her in Downton cool. Abbey and then you were just loitering around the front like, of the house? She's going to be my friend. Through friends <laughs> of friends, we'd sort of connected and Susie helped me find the house that I live in. Yeah, <laughs> because at some, uh, somebody moved out and they needed somebody in and then I sort of posted it and then that was like a good few years. But you became while. friends while shooting the show. Yeah, I think yeah. the first time we met was in our chemistry read audition. And we sort of hit it off, didn't we? We did, yeah. So what happens if you don't know? When you have two characters that have to have some sort of relationship or close relationship and it's sort of central to the story, is you'll have a chemistry read. So that's when you'll get a combination of lots of different actors to read together to see whether it just works. And I I think I was the last person you read with. Mm, I think yeah. you were... You were cast quite a while before me. Yeah, I was cast and I'd had a few reads with um, various different actors for different roles. And then um, they were really searching for something special for Raquel. Oh. And along came Susie Wakoma and filled that special box. <laughs> <laughs> that special box. <laughs> yeah, it sounded different when I said that. I think we're going, to, we're going to have an exclusive yes. today. <laughs> um, ah, well... <laughs> And did the fact that you were basically beating up supernatural bad guys and defending yourself and defending others and playing these very feminist women, do you think it really bonded you on screen? Is there, do you have another female friend that replicates this relationship? Well, I think I knew immediately it was very special, given the opportunity of playing these roles. I mean, the first time I read the script, hashtag spoilers again, but within the first three pages I'm pissing on someone so it was I knew it was there's something a bit different it was about for it. an exorcism to be fair yeah there were reasons it's fundamental so to an exorcism guys I do make you do it um, <laughs> so I knew that it was an unusual special interesting project anyway but the fact that it was these two girls who make this unlikely friendship and end up really relying on each other for survival and the stakes were so high you know saving the world it was kind of where we were at it was great. We kept saying, we got to do all the stuff. You know, like when you mm. watch things and like Susie, you know, what you're talking about, watching these things growing up and wanting to solve crimes or save the world. I love superhero movies. So I've always wanted to be a superhero. And this was kind of, we get to do all the stuff. Mm. We're doing the saving. And normally it's special. guys doing it mm. or yeah. there's one woman tacked on the end. Yeah, And the whole thing of the usual dynamic being the main girl and her best friend who sort of helps her while she goes off, maybe goes off with some dude, I don't know. In this situation, it was the two of us very much a team that absolutely required the other one to go out and save the world. Yes, absolutely. And you're not sexualised either. I know Buffy's really held up as a feminist piece of work, and in many cases it is. But the first time I saw it, I was like, why is everyone so into this? And I really, you know, she is dressed in really skin-tight clothing and Mm. she is sort of kicking her legs up a lot. Mm. And I feel like this is presented, not that you're not attractive, obviously, you're both very (laughs) sexy and attractive. Of course. But you're not being (laughs) shot that way. Mm. You're being shot as powerful women as friends as women with sex lives and Mm -hmm. romantic lives but that's not where the focus is and Mm -hmm. it feels like a really feminist piece of work now everyone wants a second season of it is that going to happen (sighs) not there are no plans as yet um Unfortunately. So Channel exactly. 4 are not recommissioning it? No. Channel and it's on not. Netflix around the world at the moment. In the UK as well, so you don't need to watch it with ads, which is just boring. Great. No so you can see it on Netflix at the Netflix. moment. We would love to do more because Absolutely. we just had an Well, I've got a pitch for Netflix, okay, 
What about the crazy head women mm -hmm. to avoid the demons that are here in Britain go to America and okay. think, oh, we'll just live normal lives. But guess what? <gasps> There are demons in America as well. Right. And then they have to fight American demons. Okay, I see That's that. That's my pitch for American Netflix. I like it. Is that, that very simple? Just a couple of passports, fly over. Yeah. Bish, bash, bosh. Absolutely. And if we can tie in it being some kind of road trip movie as well, yeah. a la Thelma and Louise, I think that'd really sell. Yeah. Can you drive those Susie with Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I no, did, I did tell them about uh, Susie's... <laughs> Susie doesn't drive, but in the story, uh, <laughs> Susie, well. Susie's character, you, Raquel, is the only character that drives. And we did a lot of green screen. Um, Susie did all of her Susie own stunts except driving. Car, <laughs> um, doing lots of um, driving acting. And every now and again, there was one day when we, we had some very intense scene. We're driving quickly away, being chased. <laughs> and they'd be like, OK, Kurt, Susie, um, we need you to look in your mirrors a bit more. And she's like, I don't drive. <laughs> would you look in your mirrors though if you're driving from demons wouldn't you just be like mm -hmm. well that's what I thought mirror mirror ten to two I mean like reminding, we're just reminding her to you know just look like you're driving, look like you're driving. Animate. Driving. Yeah, it was act. fun and sometimes I'd be like Cara Cara I'm really stressed you'd be like okay all right you just look in your mirror okay just look forward do that with that not too there was definitely a moment of going Susie you need to ignition Yeah! Turn, <laughs> turn it on, otherwise it doesn't start. I was like, okay, cool. I feel like I can drive now. You, you can't. You can't. You can't. So it's important that you don't drive unless there is a green screen in place. Then I am the best. <laughs> <laughs> What female friendships on screen have inspired you? Were you Sex and the City girls? Are you girls' girls? I think both are kind of iconic in different ways. But it, interesting, growing up... Girls wasn't around, but Friends was, I think, more oh. something that I sort of followed growing up. And Thelma and Louise is one that popped into my head and Romeo and Michelle's High School Reunion. Female friendships on screen. I actually found it difficult to think of many that had a similar dynamic to Crazy Head, where it's two girls or a group of girls with an equal part. It's so easy to think of so many buddy movies, you know, and two guys mm. like partnerships and duos. And I don't know if that's just, I don't know enough films, which would be very embarrassing as an actor, but I found it really difficult. I Googled it. Mm. I know what you mean. They're really iconic when they come because mm. in general, women are represented so much less. And the Gina Davis Institute recently brought something out about how little women speak in movies. And even in movies where the movie is about a woman or it has a titular woman, mm. Don't snigger. Whoa. I know you, Susie. You said tit. You brought tit. No, in. I did not bring tit. I mind my own business. I mean, eponymous. It's my mind. I business. just, I Think know. about how to drive. And you just brought tit. <laughs> Even when the woman's name is in the title or the movie is about women, women still speak less than men on screen. So you're right. We hold these movies very precious. Thelma and Louise is very precious to us mm. because there are just so many movies about two guys on the road, so mm. many buddy movies, so many cop mm. movies, so many double acts of men. I just had to, uh, for a television film review show, go and watch three movies. And they're all about male characters and I thought one of the ones I was going to see was about a female lead and they switched it on me to what another one about a guy and I was just so gutted because I was like I don't know how much longer I can be asked to empathize with the problem of the straight white man mm. and listen that's a perfectly valid window to look out of mm. but we just see it as generic human if you're watching late night American television you are looking out of a window it's the window of a straight white man who's a father who's married in a heterosexual relationship and his name's Jimmy and uh, and he lives in Los Angeles. And that's the, it's Jimmy Kimmel, it's it's Jimmy, Jimmy or Fallon Jimmy. or Jimmy Corden. Those are the, <laughs> they're your options. But it is an experience. It is a life experience. Mm. It's not a generic experience. But as soon as a woman gets a late night show, it's like, oh, it's a female mm. experience. And I You don't like notice until, you take it, I mean, I, I don't think growing up I felt, oh, I'm missing out on girl buddy movies or anything like that. We just it's only when they it. come along you go, mm. oh, this is different. Mm. But it does feel like they come along and then like the people in charge of the films go, cool, we don't need to do one for another 20 years. Like oh, Thelma yeah. and Louise really felt like it should have been the beginning of something and how long ago was that? And even with Bridesmaids, you watch Bridesmaids, you're like, oh my gosh, that's in, in, for me as a comedy lover, enthusiast, nut, I was like, this is the beginning of loads of these and... There's just not been the output because it does always feel 
niche for whatever reason, even when it's excellent, even when it does make, let's be honest, because the people who make the films care about money, even when they do the box office thing, it just never, ever feels like it's going to change things, oh, except for now, I think. Or they'll say, we've already got a female show in development at this network. And I always want to say, and have you got one male one as well? Yeah, um, because balance. Yeah, so you've got two shows in development. What are you going to do for all the other shows that you need to fill you? <laughs> <laughs> genuinely, they say that. And now, I mean, Fleabag was incredible, and I adore it, and I adore Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Every single other female show now has to be compared to Fleabag, yeah. mm-hmm. which must be wearing for Phoebe as yeah. well. It's yeah. just like, oh, well, how does this stand up to Fleabag? Or how does it stand up to... It's not even the same genre as Fleabag. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, it's got a woman one in it. Um, <laughs> we need to compare it to that. It's like, you know, Chewing Gum, the black Fleabag, you know, uh, Roisin Connolly show. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. You know, or Roisin Connolly show, it's oh, sort yeah. of like, oh, well, it's Fleabag, but slightly less dark or you know it's like, or it's just its own show I think they want everything to be the new something even with Crazy Head when they were pitching that it was Buffy meets yeah. Misfits which is really like clever and that mm. works but every time you're asked to describe it and they say I hear it's like the new Buffy meets Misfits you think oh can't it just be can't it be its own show it's what it is so what do we love about let's look at Friends because you've raised that car and I yeah. think it's a really good one and the one that we sort of don't think about so much and that was actually Although the representation in other ways was very poor in Friends, I mean, it's basically white, straight, non-disabled, cis people looking beautiful in a coffee shop. Um, But uh, in terms of gender... Uh, Having really unrealistic Susie's now Susie's now drinking her coffee just like she would fit slurp, so well into slurp, slurp, Central slurp, slurp, slurp. Perk. <laughs> Listen, you would have been allowed to date Ross in season 10. Um, <laughs> When they were sick of the complaints. And Joey. <laughs> and Joey, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Was it just the one? Yes. There's no need for two black women. One, True. one black sorry, woman. Sorry, I got can, ahead of myself. I watched black, black woman can date, I got can ahead of myself. two sorry, white I'm sorry, men. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She can be yeah. a problem for two white men. Um, <laughs> um, so, what did we take away from the female friendships in Friends? I think what I loved about it is how supportive they were, because I think previously mm. women on television had often got at each other and been very competitive mm. or that undermined each other because they think, oh, well, it needs tension. Mm. But I loved the way they supported each other. Do you remember really early on, I think it's in season one, one of them's broken up with someone and they're doing a thing where they're putting the possessions and memories oh, in yeah. a box or something and burning it and then they set fire to the apartment and yeah. the firemen come and they all start hitting on the firemen. Yeah. <laughs> that really is lovely. I, yeah, I, th- I would... <laughs> and that's, 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 for, it is so... Debs, it's, it's, it is, though. I'm a so feminist, transparent. but it is lovely. Oh, my gosh. It's know, so it transparent. But, you, but, you, but we've all had bonding <laughs> moments like that where we've sort of stayed up We're like... Hot really... men have turned up with hoses. <laughs> okay, that part didn't happen. That was but, last night. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Carry on. <laughs> but I have a couple of friends... We have what we call the hurly-burly. And the hurly-burly is if one of us is having a crisis, we can call on the other two. And they basically have to come. It's like the bat signal. (laughs) If you just text hurly-burly, then one of the three will come to the other one's rescue. But ideally, all of us in one of our flats or a very particular corner booth of a Japanese restaurant that's round a corner so no one can see you cry. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it could be romantic, it could be professional, it could be health or mental health, but we all come together and we have the most supportive, loving session and we will not leave until we've exhausted the issue and we've talked about it from all of the different angles. Do you know why we call it the hurly-burly? You're actors, so you will know probably if you think about it. Is it about the three witches? When shall we three meet again? And when the hurly-burly comes, it's about the Weird Sisters. It's about the three witches in Macbeth. And so we are basically the Weird Sisters, and we get together, and we we sometimes cast an incantation on (laughs) the man in question. In a Japanese restaurant in the corner. (laughs) Just Just sometimes. Getting your your incantation on. (laughs) Well, we'll go through it, and we'll be really supportive. Like, sometimes even if... Do you know when you've got female friends uh, who, even if you think, He's got a point. You don't say that. (laughs) It's important not to say that he's got a point because in this sacred space, and that's what I think Friends and Sex and the City gave us for all their flaws and all of their problematicnesses, that's not right, all of the ways in which they were problematic, they gave us those moments where you will support your sisters on the magic carpet even if they're not being entirely reasonable. (laughs) You will say, sister... You are right. He is wrong. Yeah. 
you hold your nerve and just cry on my shoulder and I will tell you all the things you need to hear about him right now. I agree. My female friendships in my life are some of the most important relationships Mm. I have. And I also think, as a lot of people in London aren't from London, I moved here when I was 18 and those friendships I've made since living here become a kind of family in that support network. And Susie and I have talked about this before as well, especially in this industry, having people who are a real support network for you, who you can trust and are without any other thoughts other than supporting you and encouraging you and celebrating you is so important. And I think, you know, seeing that represented on screen is invaluable it's so important to feminism it's so important to women to get to see those friendships played out and i also i you know with because i've got a very similar network to the hurley burleys and when i've been amongst that and we're you know we're all creatives and you know we come together for a variety of issues whether it's romantic whether it's health mental health and the support that i've got from that group I actually when I'm receiving it I kind of feel like gosh if everybody had this network I really think this would solve the world's <laughs> problems if you can talk through all the sort of like litany of things that just buzz through your mind if everybody had that with a group of people or a couple of people or one person that they really really trust I'm like gosh I kind of feel like it's one of the prizes of femalehood that I wish everybody had could actually have, could yeah. Have, yeah yeah we have access to What are your favourite female friendships on screen, Susie? Do you know what? I really love, and they're a little bit out of, and I don't know why, it really annoys me, like why sketch shows are a little bit sort of people, you know, no one gets excited when they hear, oh, here's a new sketch show, because you would just go, ah. But there's something about an ensemble that I just love. So it isn't necessarily a narrative of a friendship, but it's just... Oh, you mean like together. French and Saunders? Like French and Saunders. Smack the like Smack the Pony is what I was going to say. I love seeing a group of women or a couple of women just having fun with lots, like, because a sketch show, you can have lots of different narratives and play lots of different people. You don't necessarily have to be stuck down to one thing. That's a and really that's good I point. Love. And they get to dress up and they get and to be silly. ugly yeah, yeah. and silly and yeah. playful and competitive and just seeing that amazing bond between women. Yeah. Cara, what are your favourites? I think I've got Thelma and Louise blindness at the moment. No, that's good. That's really, really good. What do you love about Thelma and Louise? Well, I love the the what you were saying before about the the sort of ride or die mentality. And I've watched it very recently, which I think is why it's so full in my head. And the, the journey that they go on together, really just fucking up together, mm-hmm. I think. Do you think... Oh, go on, you go. I oh, know, I was just going to say Girls Trip. It's like the most recent one, oh. I think, that I absolutely... Firstly, I want to go to New Orleans like now mm-hmm. I want to go to Essence Festival now mm. and I want to go with Tiffany Haddish oh <laughs> yes please please, please please who doesn't want that though but I've That's... got to say that was in, in terms of like recent ones that I watched that and I just thought it's so fun and they seemed like mm. they were all having a really really fun time and I fell in love with Tiffany Haddish and that's also a movie that demonstrates sort of non-white female friendship in a really mainstream and positive way, I yeah. think. That it's sort of like, often I think black films in America are marginalised, like, well, that'll only be for a black audience then. Mm. Yeah. And I think the fact that that's mainstreaming is so important. Yeah. Again, in the same way that we're all asked to empathise through white men's eyes all the time, mm. it's important for white men and white women to empathise through black women's eyes more regularly. Yeah. And the only way to do that is to make films like that more mainstream. And Tiffany Haddish, my God, she is... Sorry. Is she the funniest woman alive? Yeah. I just think so. Did you guys see that clip of her talking about taking Will Smith and Jada in, in on a Groupon <laughs> tour of a swamp in New Orleans when they were making that movie? <laughs> it's the funniest thing. If you haven't seen it, you've got to look it up. But she basically says, they say, what are you doing tomorrow? And she says, I'm going on a Groupon uh, on a boat trip of the swamps to see the alligators in New Orleans. And they say they'll come. And she's like, Really? What? And when they get there, they didn't understand what a Groupon was. <laughs> they thought it was like she'd hired a boat to take a group on. <laughs> and because they can't imagine anything that's not private. Yeah. And so then suddenly Jade is like, oh, maybe not. And Will's like, no, we've come to see alligators. I'm going to see alligators. So just gets on the boat and says to everyone, let's take some pictures at the end. This is not the Will Smith boat. This is the alligator tour. So let's look at the alligators. And it's the way she tells it, it might be the funniest thing I've ever seen. I've watched it so many times. Yeah, me and I'm kind of crying with laughter. <laughs> um. Oh, 
Hello, I'm John Dorney. And I'm Jessica Regan. And I'm Tom Zelinski. And we've started a new podcast called Best Pick. We're all writers and actors of one sort or another, and we're starting a podcast to explore all the Academy Award Best Picture winners in no particular order. We're going to put all 89 winning movies in a hat, and for each episode, we'll pick one out at random. Then we'll discuss it, watch it, review it, and at the end of the show, we'll pick out the movie for next time. New episodes will be released every other Wednesday at 12 noon UK time. And you can find them all at bestpickpod.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Anyone have any questions? Oh, yes, people do. Hi, I'm a big fan. I organize um, events for women to make friends, and I often say that making female friends is a little like dating. You know, there's like a chemistry aspect, and kind of if you don't hit it off right away, and you have to maintain, make sure that you continue to see each other. But the other side of that is that sometimes those relationships become so close that they fall apart. So my, I actually have two questions. One is that. What would you say to women, adult women, who are kind of like turning a new page and want to make new friends? And are there any examples on film of that? And also, have either have any of you ever experienced a female friendship just completely blowing up? Oh, yes. <laughs> so how do you make new friends? I think making new friends is super hard, isn't it? Like, I, there's just a point where you're so sort of, you've got your life in order and together, and then to sort of like, introduce somebody else into it or find a place for them can be a bit nerve-wracking I think we're quite lucky with yeah, our we're job we're super lucky that we often start new projects with new groups of people and so you all you know, the time I think you make those new harder, connections it's harder to keep friends That's because when is. the production's over or the play is over everyone says they'll stay together forever and then you never hear from them mm, again exactly or is that just me <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's true though actors talk about that a lot that yeah. Yeah. this amazing very, very, very bond very intense and then mm. you know you go back to real life um, yeah, I'm just trying to think of it on screen. In Beaches, they meet as children. Mm. And I think some of our childhood friends, sometimes rekindling a childhood friend can yeah. actually be really lovely. Mm. And in... Oh, uh, new friendships. Mia's w- wedding, they were friends at school, weren't they? And they, yeah, they bump into each they other. There's a lot of that on screen. A fresh new friendship. A fresh new friendship. Gosh, that's really true. We need, we need Well, that. in Friends, Rachel runs away from her wedding mm-hmm. yeah. and just turns up in the cafe. Again, a friend from school, but she makes friends with the rest of them from it. Yeah. I think in real life, I, th- I love that you're organising events because I think it can be difficult to create new friendships. But I think actually understanding that more people want friends than you realise. So mm-hmm. making those overtures will usually be rewarded. But like romantic relationships, you have to be able to understand if somebody doesn't want it, you have to be able to walk away and protect yourself from it. But occasionally, it really, really works. And if you feel the spark, it's there. I met Susie at a party on New Year's Eve, and I was just like, yes, I'm your friend now. And sometimes I do, I declare that. She really wouldn't leave me alone. No, that's, I was just like, can you, and the thing is I've got shows people can be in and I use that terribly. I go, do you want to be in my shows? And then people do want to be in shows. So they go, yeah, I do want to be in a show. And then I go, if you're in my show, you're my friend. And then I did it, Hannah Gadsby, I played the long game with her. I saw her show, she's huge now. But at the time, she was quite successful in Australia, but she wasn't known here. And I went to the Edinburgh Festival. There were seven people in the audience. This is years ago, years and years ago. I laughed so loudly at her show. And there were seven people. And the other people were a bit shy and they weren't laughing. And I was just there alone going... <laughs> and at the end of the show, I went up to her and I went, that was the funniest show I've ever seen and the most moving. It was about her coming out story. And I said, we're friends now. And she, <laughs> she did not agree. Uh, <laughs> And I, we always joked that I played the long game, that I knew that we would be friends, and now we're very close friends. In terms of a bust-up, mm-hmm. a friend that's, friendship that's gone wrong, without naming names, <laughs> can you, is there anything you can say about that? I think it's important to just know when, just know when. I'm very good at sort of going, all right, I can feel that this is not mutually beneficial mm. to us in any way, whether it be emotional or anything like that. Um, yeah, you have to surround yourself with people who make you feel good. Yeah. And I think if you start feeling that you don't actually feel good in a certain, whether it's a relationship, friendship, family, whatever, then I think it's important self-care yeah. to say, you know what, I don't need that. Do you know, I actually had a friend recently who said it was very, I sort of sensed that something was wrong. So I approached her about it and she basically said, you know what, I just find, you know, you being all busy and stuff quite difficult. And there were two sides of it. I was like, I think it's great that you are 
acknowledging that in this day and age where you know you instagram this you post this it can seem a little bit too much if you're knowing too much about other people's lives and you're not feeling good and you want to sort of make distance in that way but then similarly i thought well i only really want friends who are happy for me the way that i am happy for them and if that is a painful thing for you and i love my work and i work really hard then it's okay and there's no beef but yeah see you later and it was, I just felt it was really good for her to acknowledge that she found things difficult. And it allowed me to go, oh, okay, cool. So if you're not happy for me, then that, you know, that's not the soul, that's not the point of a friendship purely. But if you are, you know, achieving things that you want to achieve, or you just feeling positive in whatever shape that is, and somebody really doesn't like feels a coldness about that, that's not good. I said I was sorry. <laughs> um, well, I just don't believe you. So I thought I'd just get you to say it. You were so jealous you could hardly breathe. <laughs> Creatures. Uh, Is there any chance, Susie, that in the style of Arnold Schwarzenegger, oh. you could read... Oh, people gosh. love it when people do it in a style. I'm really trying All to bring right. this in. I'm trying to make it a thing. Oh, now no, he won't work with me. Okay. <laughs> do you want to be on The American Apprentice? Do we think he's a fan of the show? I'm going to make him a fan of the show <laughs> with this. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. Mm. To, to keep track. To, <laughs> to ke- uh, it's just going to. Don't. Carl. No, I'm sorry. I'm um, counting you from here. To ke- <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I know we haven't got time. Okay. To keep track of everything we're up to... That's not good! (laughs) To keep track... Okay. To keep track of everything we're up to, you can follow Guild Fam Pod on Twitter or The Guilty Feminist on Instagram. There's also a Facebook page you can like and a mailing list you can sign up to. And if you like what you hear, please go to what we're now supposed to call Apple Podcasts and rate... What am I rolling my eyes? Review and subscribe. That's not... It helps other people to discover us. That sounds <laughs> so African. <laughs> that sounded a little bit like your mother and Arnold Schwarzenegger had had a baby and raised me. Them. <laughs> um, before we do our final outro, I've got you a little present. This is because you're the crazy head girls. I found these little bags that say "Wicked Sister" and "Sisters" spelt S-I-S-T-A. Isn't that great? And because you are in a way the Wicked Sisters, and it's a little bit hurly burly here as well, I'm going to give you the gold one because you're a demon hunter and you are half demon. So I'm going to give you that sort of slightly more. I love things to put other things in. (laughs) It's one of my favourite things. Yep, it's a bag. It's a bag. Boom. A bag is something to put something else in. That is the definition of a bag. But it doesn't have to be a bag, it could be a box. Mm. This, I feel, feel like this could be a, It's a hobby. Come this on. is why she's my friend. <laughs> Cara, have you got anything we should see? You can see Crazy Head on the old Netflix. Um, and my new show, Absentia, is on Amazon. Absentia, Absentia. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's really good. <laughs> Brilliant. And Susan McComa? Oh, gosh, I've got two TV shows that I can't talk about and a film that I can't talk about. So, um... Yeah. Crypt. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Watch out for Susie Wacoma doing mystery projects. And BFI, is there anything we should promote for you? Girlfriends. 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 Girlfriend. What was that? Women's month. June. Women's June. month. The whole of June. <laughs> We're promoting the whole of June. Plug in June just as a good month. We won't be snowing then. Uh, June. Watch out for June. It's a, come, a month coming to a London near you. It's going to be great, guys. It's going to be sunny. You can be outside. No, don't go outside. It probably will still be raining because it's London. It'll probably still be snowing. This is meant to be fucking spring. So come into the BFI because it's Women's Month. Can we come back again then? Okay, so we'll do another thing then. Um, so we'll be back here in June along with the program can we show a film can we have like a thing and then show a film and talk about it okay great and what so it's beaches can we specifically show beaches okay great I'm on for that and what's the movie Girlfriends the season's called Girlfriends in June oh the season is called Girlfriends hashtag BFI Girlfriends okay 
Why is it called girlfriend slow? That doesn't sound very feminist. Like, it's, oh, it's, that's the point. It's ironic. Oh, it was about friends who were girls. We're I thought girlfriends. you meant being defined by your romantic relationship. No. Oh, I see. We're girlfriends. Oh, I see. I see. So June is coming, coming to a calendar near you. Confusing. Acknowledge it with all of your heart. <laughs> see you back here in June. You've been lovely. Thank you. I've been listening to the Guilty Feminist with me. Susan McCoy, our very special guest, Carla Theobald. The recording engineer was Grundy Lazimbra. Music was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Slinsky for the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Tony and Hannah at PBJ Live and everyone at the PFI, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. So I'm going to do my quiz now. All right. Oh, let's Come play on. I'm a Feminist Butt. <laughs> Says Cute. the cis white yeah. man. I mean, I just really wanted to be off the back because I thought otherwise we're going to talk about things. But <laughs> the patriarch has told us that's not the correct order. <laughs> <clears throat> correct order is important <laughs> to patriarchal forces. <clears throat> If we won't form ourselves into orderly cues, how will they know who to oppress? <laughs> it's true, though. That is true. It's true. It's That's true. true. It's true. We cooperate with them.